Chapter 14 From one survivor to another No one heals in a straight line. One January evening in 1969, when Audrey comes home from a babysitting job, Bela and I ask her and John to sit on the brown Danish couch in the living room. I can't look at Bela, I can t look at my children, I stare at the clean modern lines of the couch, its thin little legs. Bela starts to cry. Did someone die? Audrey asks. Just tell us. Johnny kicks his feet nervously against the couch. Everything's fine, Bela says. We love you both very much. Your mother and I have decided that we need to live in separate houses for a while. He stutters as he speaks, the sentences last a year. What are you saying? Audrey asks. What's going on? We need to explore how to have more peace in our family, I say. This isn't your fault. You don't love each other anymore? We do, Bela says. I do. This is his jab, the one knife he points at me. You're not happy all of a sudden? I thought you were happy. Or have you just been lying to us our whole lives? Audrey has been clutching her babysitting money in her hand. When she turned 12, Bela opened a checking account for her and said he would double any dollar that she made, but now she throws her money on the couch, as though we have contaminated every good or valuable thing. It was an accrual of experiences, not a sudden recognition, that led me to divorce Bela. My choice had something to do with my mother, what she had chosen and what she hadn't been allowed to choose. Before she married my father, she was working for a consulate in Budapest, she was earning her own money, she was part of a cosmopolitan social and professional circle. She was quite liberated for her time. But then her younger sister got married, and the pressure was on her to do what her society and family expected of her to marry before she became an embarrassment. There was a man she loved, someone she met through her work at the consulate, the man who had given her the inscribed copy of Gone with the Wind. But her father forbade her to marry him because he wasn't Jewish. My father, the celebrated tailor, fit her for a dress one day, he admired her figure, and she opted to leave the life she had chosen for herself in favor of the life she was expected to live. In marrying Bela, I feared I had done the same thing, forgone taking responsibility for my own dreams in exchange for the safety Bela provided me. Now the qualities that had drawn me to him, his ability to provide and caretake, felt suffocating, our marriage felt like an abdication of myself. I didn't want the kind of marriage my parents had, lonely, lacking in intimacy, and I didn't want their broken dreams, my father's, to be a doctor, my mother's, to be a career woman, to marry for love. But what did I want for myself? I didn't know. And so I erected Bela as a force to push against. In place of discovering my own genuine purpose and direction, I found meaning in fighting against him, against the ways I imagined that he limited me. Really, Bela was supportive of my schooling, he paid for my tuition, he loved talking with me about the philosophy and literature I was reading, he found my reading lists and analyses interesting compliments to his favorite subject, history. Maybe because Bela occasionally expressed some resentment for the time I gave to school, or because in the interest of my own health he sometimes cautioned me to slow down, the notion took root and grew in me that if I wanted to progress in my life, it would have to be on my own. I was so hungry so tired of discounting myself. I remember traveling with Audrey to a swim meet in San Angelo in 1967, when she was 13. The other parents' chaperones got together in the hotel in the evening and drank and caroused. If Bela had been there, I realized, we would have been at the center of the activity, not because either of us liked to be around heavy drinking, but because Bela was a natural charmer. He saw a room of people and he couldn't stay away. 
Any room that he occupied became a social sphere, people drawn into convivial relationship because of the atmosphere he created. I admired this about him, and I resented it too, resented the ways I became silent so that his voice could ring. Just like in my family growing up, there was room for one star. At our weekly prime rib and dancing dates with friends in El Paso, I got to share the light when everyone made room for Bela and me on the dance floor. Together, we were sensational, our friends said, it was hard to look away. We were admired as a couple, but there wasn't space for just me. That night in San Angelo, I found the noise and drunkenness of the other parents unpleasant, and I was about to retreat to my room. I was lonely, feeling a little sorry for myself. Then I flashed on Frankel's book. On my freedom to choose my own response to any situation. I did something I had never done before. I knocked on the door of Audrey's hotel room. She was surprised to see me, but she invited me in. She and her friends were playing cards, watching TV. When I was your age, I said, I was an athlete too. Audrey's eyes opened wide. You girls are so lucky and beautiful. You know what it is to have a strong body. To work hard. To be a team. I told them what my ballet teacher had told me a lifetime ago. All your ecstasy in life is going to come from the inside. I said good night and started to walk out the door, but before I left the room, I did a high kick. Audrey's eyes glittered with pride. Her friends clapped and cheered. I wasn't the quiet mom with the strange accent. I was the performer, the athlete, the mom whose daughter admired her. Inside, I equated that feeling of self-worth and elation with Bela's absence. If I wanted to feel that glow more often, perhaps I needed to be with him less often. That hunger for self fueled me in my undergraduate studies too. I was voracious, always in search of more knowledge, and also the respect and approval that might signal to me that I was of value. I stayed up all night working on papers that were already good, for fear that they wouldn't, or would only, be good enough. When a psychology professor announced to our class at the beginning of the semester that he only gave C's, I marched to his office, told him I only earned as, and asked what I could do to continue my exceptional academic performance. He invited me to work with him as an assistant, augmenting my classroom learning with field experience usually granted only to graduate students. One afternoon, some of my classmates invited me to join them for a beer after class. I sat with them in the darkened bar near campus, my chilled glass on the table, enthralled by their youthful energy, their political passion. I admired them, social justice advocates, pacifists. I was happy to be included. And sad too. This stage of my life had been cut short individuation and independence from my family, dating and romance, participation in social movements that were bringing about real change. I had lost my childhood to the war, my adolescence to the death camps, and my young adulthood to the compulsion to never look back. I had become a mother before I had grieved my own mother's death. I had tried too fast and too soon to be whole. It wasn't Bela's fault that I had chosen denial, that I often kept myself my memories, my true opinions and experiences hidden, even from him. But now I held him responsible for prolonging my stuckness. That day over beers, one of my fellow students asked me how Bela and I had met. I love a good love story, she said. Was it love at first sight? I don't remember how I answered her but I do know that the question made me think, again, about the kind of love I wished I'd had. With Eric there had been sparks, a flush all over my body when he was near. Even Auschwitz didn't kill the romantic girl in me, the girl who told herself each day that she might meet him again. 
But after the war, that dream died. When I met Bela, I wasn't in love, I was hungry. And he brought me Swiss cheese. He brought me salami. I could remember feeling happy in those early years with Bela, when I was pregnant with Marianne, walking to the market every morning to buy flowers, talking to her in my womb, telling her how she was going to blossom like a flower. And she had, all of my children had. And now I was forty years old, the age my mother had been when she died, and I still hadn't blossomed, still hadn't had the love I thought I was due. I felt cheated, denied of an essential human right, trapped in a marriage that had become a meal consumed with no expectation of nourishment, with no hope of erasing hunger. My sustenance came from an unexpected source. One day in 1968, I came home to find a letter in the mailbox addressed to me in a European-looking hand, sent from Southern Methodist University, in Dallas. There was no name above the return address, only initials, VF. When I opened the letter, I almost fell over. From one survivor to another, the salutation read. The letter was from Viktor Frankl. Following my pre-dawn immersion in man's search for meaning two years earlier, I had written an essay called, Victor Frankl and Me. I had written it for myself, it was a personal exercise, not an academic one, my first attempt to speak about my past. Timidly, cautiously hopeful for the possibility of personal growth, I had shared it with some professors and some friends, and eventually it had found its way into a campus publication. Someone had anonymously mailed a copy of my article to Frankel in Dallas, where, unbeknownst to me, he had been a visiting professor since 1966. Frankel was 23 years my senior, he had been 39 years old, already a successful physician and psychiatrist, when he was interned at Auschwitz. Now he was the celebrated founder of logotherapy. He had practiced, lectured, and taught all over the world. And he had been moved enough by my little essay to contact me, to relate to me as a fellow survivor, as a peer. I had written about imagining myself on stage at the Budapest Opera House the night I was forced to dance for Mengel. Frankel wrote that he had done something similar at Auschwitz, in his worst moments, he had imagined himself a free man, giving lectures in Vienna on the psychology of imprisonment. He had also found a sanctuary in an inner world that both shielded him from his present fear and pain, and inspired his hope and sense of purpose, that gave him the means and a reason to survive. Frankel's book and his letter helped me find words for our shared experience. So began a correspondence and a friendship that would last for many years, in which we would try together to answer the questions that ran through our lives. Why did I survive? What is the purpose in my life? What meaning can I make from my suffering? How can I help myself and others to endure the hardest parts of life and to experience more passion and joy? After exchanging letters for several years, we met for the first time at a lecture he gave in San Diego in the 1970s. He invited me backstage to meet his wife and even asked me to critique his talk, a hugely important moment to be treated by my mentor as a peer. Even his first letter nourished in me the seed of a calling, the search to make meaning in my life by helping others to make meaning, to heal so that I could heal others, so that I could heal myself. It also reinforced my understanding, however misapplied when I divorced Bela, that I had the power and opportunity, as well as the responsibility, to choose my own meaning, my own life. I had taken my first conscious step toward finding my own way in the late 1950s, when I noticed Johnny's developmental challenges and needed help in meeting them. A friend recommended a Jungian analyst who had studied in Switzerland. I knew next to nothing about clinical psychology in general or Jungian analysis in particular, but after looking into the subject a bit, several Jungian ideas appealed to me. I liked the emphasis on myths and archetypes, which reminded me of the literature I had loved as a girl. 
and I was intrigued by the notion of bringing the conscious and unconscious parts of one's psyche together into a balanced whole. I remembered the images of dissonance between Vicky Page's inner and outer experience in the red shoes, and of course I was suffering in the grip of my own inner conflicts. I wasn't consciously entering therapy to heal that tension in myself, I really just wanted to know what to do for my son and how to heal the rift between Bela and me over what to do. But I also felt drawn to Carl Jung's vision of therapeutic analysis, it is a matter of saying yet to oneself, of taking oneself as the most serious of tasks, of being conscious of everything one does, and keeping it constantly before one's eyes in all its dubious aspects, truly a task that taxes us to the utmost. Saying yeah, to myself. I wanted to do that. I wanted to blossom and improve. My therapist gave me dream homework, and I studiously recorded my dreams. Almost always, I was flying. I could choose how high or low to the ground to fly, how fast or how slow. I could choose which landscapes to fly over, European cathedrals, forested mountains, ocean beaches. I looked forward to sleep so that I could have these dreams in which I was joyful and strong, flying free, in control. I found in those dreams my power to transcend the limiting assumptions that others often imposed on my son. And I found my desire to transcend what I perceived to be the limitations imposed on me. I didn't yet know that the limitations that needed transcending weren't without, they were within. So when, years later, under the influence of Viktor Frankl, I began to question what I wanted out of life, it was easy for me to think that saying no to Bela would be one way of saying yes to myself. In the months after the divorce, I felt better. For several years I had been suffering from migraines, my mother had also struggled with debilitating headaches, I assumed they were hereditary, but right after Bela and I separated, the migraines disappeared, departing like a season. I thought it was because now I was living free from Bela's weather, his yelling and cynicism, his irritation and disappointment. My headaches disappeared and so did my need to hide, to retreat. I invited fellow students and our professors to my house, I hosted raucous parties, I felt at the center of a community, open to the world. I was living the way I wanted to live, I thought. But soon a fog set in. My surroundings looked grey-washed. I had to remind myself to eat. One Saturday morning in May 1969, I sit at home alone in the den. It's my graduation day. I am 42 years old. I am graduating with a B.S. in psychology from the University of Texas, El Paso, I am graduating with honors. Yet I can't make myself walk in the ceremony. I am too ashamed. I should have done this years ago, I tell myself. What I really mean, the subtext of so many of my choices and beliefs, is, I don't deserve to have survived. I am so obsessed with proving my worth, with earning my place in the world, that I don't need Hitler anymore. I have become my own jailer, telling myself, no matter what you do, you will never be good enough. What I miss the most about Bela is the way he dances. Especially the Viennese waltz. As cynical and angry as he can be, he also lets joy in, he lets his body wear it, express it. He can surrender to the tempo and still lead, hold steady. I dream of him some nights. Of his childhood, the stories he told me in letters when he courted me. I see his father collapse into an avalanche, his breath lost in all that white. I see his mother panic in a Budapest market and confess her identity to the SS. I think of the sad tension in Bela's family stemming from his mother's role in their deaths. I think of Bela's stutter, the way his early trauma marked him. One summer day Bela comes to pick up John. He's driving a new car. In America, 
we have always owned frugal cars, dumpy cars, our children say. Today he's driving an Oldsmobile with leather seats. He bought it used, he says, defensive, proud. But my look of disbelief isn't about the car. It's about the elegant woman sitting in the passenger seat. He's found someone else. I am grateful for the necessity of working to support myself and my children. Work is an escape. And it gives me a clear purpose. I become a 7th and 8th grade social studies teacher in the El Paso Barrio. I receive job offers from more coveted schools in the wealthy parts of town, but I want to work with students who are bilingual, who are facing the kinds of obstacles Bela and I did when we came to America, poverty, prejudice. I want to connect my students to their choices, to show them that the more choices they have, the less they'll feel like victims. The most difficult part of my job is countering the negative voices in my students' lives, sometimes even their own parents' voices, that say they will never make it as students, that education for them isn't a viable course. You're so puny, you're so ugly, you'll never find a husband. I tell them about my crossed eyes, about my sister's silly chant, how the problem wasn't that they sang these songs to me, the problem was that I believed them. But I don't let my students know how deeply I identify with them, how hate obliterated my childhood, how I know the darkness that eats you when you've been taught to believe that you don't matter. I remember the voice that rose up through the Tatra Mountains, if you're going to live, you have to stand for something. My students give me something to stand for. But I am still numb and anxious, isolated, so brittle and sad. The flashbacks persist, they happen sometimes when I'm driving. I see a policeman in uniform at the side of the road and my vision tunnels, I feel like I will faint. I don't have a name for these experiences, I don't yet understand that they are a physiological manifestation of the grief that I haven't dealt with yet. A clue my body sends as a reminder of the feelings that I have blocked from conscious life. A storm that assaults me when I deny myself permission to feel. What are my disowned feelings? They are like strangers living in my house, invisible except for the food they steal, the furniture they leave out of place, the mud they trail down the hall. Divorce doesn't liberate me from their uneasy presence. Divorce empties the room of other distractions, of the habitual targets of my blame and resentment and forces me to sit alone with my feelings. Sometimes I call Magda. She and Nat have divorced too, and she is remarried to Ted Gilbert, a man closer to her age, a kind listener and stepfather. She and Nat have maintained a close friendship. He comes to her house for dinner two or three times a week. Be careful what you do when you're restless, my sister cautions. You can start to think the wrong things. Unimportant things. He's too this, he's too that, I've suffered enough. You end up missing the same things that drove you crazy. It's like she has read my mind, the little edge of doubt, the concession that maybe divorce isn't fixing what I thought was broken. One night a woman calls my house. She is looking for Bela. Do I know where he might be? It's his girlfriend, I realize. She's calling my house as though I keep tabs on my ex-husband, as though I owe her information, as though I am his secretary. Don't ever call me again. I shout. After I hang up, I am agitated, I can't sleep. I try to have a flying dream, a lucid dream, but I can't take flight. I keep falling, waking. It is a terrible night. And a useful one. Audrey's sleeping over at a friend's house, Johnny is already in bed. There is nowhere to go to escape from my discomfort, I just have to feel it. I cry, I feel sorry for myself, I am furious. I feel every wave of jealousy, of bitterness, of loneliness, of indignation, of self-pity, 
and on and on. And in the morning, although I haven't slept, I feel better. Calmer. Nothing has changed. I still feel abandoned, however illogically, by the husband I chose to leave. But my storminess and agitation have run their course. They aren't permanent features. They move, they change. I feel more at peace. I will have many more nights and days like this one. Times when I am alone, when I begin to practice the work of not pushing my feelings away, no matter how painful. That is the gift of my divorce, the recognition that I have to face up to what's inside me. If I am really going to improve my life, it isn't Bela or our relationship that has to change. It's me. I see the need for change, but I don't know what kind of change will help me feel freer and more joyful. I try a new therapist for fresh perspective on my marriage, but her approach isn't useful. She wags her finger at me, telling me that forcing Bela to do the grocery shopping was emasculating, that I should never have mowed the lawn and taken his male responsibilities from him. She picks at the things that were working in my marriage and recasts them as problems and faults. I try a new job, this time at a high school, where I teach introductory psychology and serve as a school counselor. But the sense of purpose I felt at the beginning of my profession begins to be eroded by the bureaucracy of schools, the huge class sizes and case loads, the inability to work effectively with individual students. There's more I have to offer, I know this, although I don't yet know what it is I am meant to do. This theme prevails, that my deepest and most important work, professionally and personally, is still to come, and still blurry, undefined. My friends Lily and Arpad are the first people to name for me what this work will entail, though I am not yet ready to acknowledge it, much less take it on. One weekend they invite me to visit them in Mexico. For years, Bela and I have vacationed with them together, this time, I go alone. The Sunday I am to return home, we linger over breakfast, coffee, fruit, the eggs I've cooked with Hungarian peppers and onions. We're worried about you, Lily says, her voice easy, gentle. I know she and Arpad were surprised by the divorce. I know they think I made a mistake. It's hard not to read her concern as judgment. I tell them about Bela's girlfriend, she's a writer or a musician, I can never remember which, she isn't a person to me, she is an idea, Bela has moved on and left me behind. My friends listen, they are sympathetic. Then they share a glance, and Arpad clears his throat. Edie, he says, Forgive me if I'm getting too personal, and you can tell me to mind my own business. But I wonder, have you ever considered that it might be beneficial for you to work through your past? Work through it? I lived it, what other work is there to do? I want to say. I've broken the conspiracy of silence. And talking hasn't made the fear or flashbacks go away. In fact, Talking seems to have made my symptoms worse. I haven't broken my silence with my children or friends in a formal way, but I no longer live in fear that they will ask me about the past. And I have tried to embrace opportunities to share my story. Recently, when a friend from my undergraduate days who went on to pursue a master's in history asked to interview me for a paper she was writing about the Holocaust, I accepted. I thought it might be a relief to tell my whole story. But when I left her house, I was shaking. I came home and vomited, just as I had a decade before when Marianne showed us the book with pictures of concentration camp inmates. The past is past, I tell Lily and Arpad now. I'm not ready to heed or even understand Arpad's advice to work through the past. But, like Viktor Frankl's letter, it plants a seed within me, something that will sprout and take root with time. One Saturday I am sitting at the table in the kitchen, grading my students' psychology exams, when Bela calls. 
It's his day with Audrey and John. My mind leaps to fear. What's wrong? I say. Nothing's wrong. They're watching TV. He goes quiet, he waits for his voice to catch up. Come to dinner, he finally says. With you? With me. I'm busy, I say. I am. I have a date with a sociology professor. I have already called Marianne, asking for advice. What should I wear? What should I say? What should I do if he invites me to go home with him? Do not sleep with him, she has warned me. Especially not on a first date. Edith Eva Ager, my ex-husband pleads, please, please let the kids spend the night with friends and agree to come to dinner with me. Whatever it is, we can discuss it on the phone, or when you drop the kids off. No, he says. No. This is not a conversation for the phone or the front door. I assume it has to do with the children, and I agree to meet him at our favorite prime rib restaurant, our old date spot. I'm picking you up, he says. He arrives exactly on time, dressed for a date in a dark suit and silk tie. He leans in to kiss my cheek and I don't want to move away, I want to stay near his cologne, his cleanly shaved chin. In the restaurant, at our old table, he takes my hands. Is it possible, he asks, that we have more to build together? His question sends my mind spinning, as though we are already on the dance floor. Try again? Reunite? What about her? I ask. She's a lovely person. She's fun. She's a very good companion. So, let me finish. Tears begin to well in his eyes and fall down his face. She's not the mother of my children. She didn't spring me out of jail in Presov. She's never heard of the Tatra Mountains. She can't pronounce chicken paprikash, much less make it for dinner. Edie, she isn't the woman I love. She isn't you. The compliments feel good, the embrace of our shared past, but what strikes me most deeply is Bela's readiness for risk. This has always been true of him, as far as I can tell. He chose to fight Nazis in the forest. He risked death by disease and bullets to stop what was unconscionable. I was conscripted into risk. Bela chose risk knowingly, and he chooses it again at this table allowing himself to be vulnerable to the possibility of my rejecting him. I have become so used to measuring all the ways he falls short that I have stopped counting who he is, what he offers. I have to leave this marriage or I'm going to die, I had thought. And perhaps the months and years I've spent apart from him have helped me come of age, have helped me discover that there is no we until there is an I. Now that I have faced myself a little more fully, I can see that the emptiness I felt in our marriage wasn't a sign of something wrong in our relationship, it was the void I carry with me, even now, the void that no man or achievement will ever fill. Nothing will ever make up for the loss of my parents and childhood. And no one else is responsible for my freedom. I am. Please support me with a like and a subscription. Thank you.